Hi, this is Jeremy Faust, Editor-in-Chief of MedPage Today. We're going to talk about long COVID and Paxlovid. Does Paxlovid actually help people with diagnosed long COVID get better? This is a study that is being conducted. There are several studies. And one of the investigators on one of those studies is cardiologist and Yale School of Medicine outcomes researcher, Dr. Harlan Krumholtz. Harlan, great to see you. It's great to see you, Jeremy. All right, so long COVID, you have been studying this uh, and you're currently engaged in a randomized clinical trial. Can you tell us what you guys are looking at? Sure, and when you say you guys, let me just say, you know, I have the great privilege of working with Akiko Osaki. And and honestly, for me, the, the ability to work with a renowned scientist like that in the lab is essential to this kind of research. I mean, I'm a clinical investigator. I'm an outcomes researcher. I really care whether or not we can produce knowledge that can tangibly improve people's lives, help them feel better, actually relieve the suffering. But I recognize in a condition like this, unlike where I'm usually studying, you know, heart disease is fairly well characterized. It's pretty mature. We still have a lot to learn. But, you know, I've never been in a situation where we've got a disease that that is puzzling to most people. They don't understand the underlying mechanisms. It's not clear what the taxonomy is, what, what we're actually dealing with. And, you know, what an honor for me to be able to work with someone who can actually, you know, help provide insight into the underlying immunologic dimensions of this condition. So, you, you know, you guys, that plus we got a whole team of people, really talented individuals. And, and we came together and said, you know, there are various different underlying causes potentially of, of long COVID. And one of them is this idea of viral persistence, that people just never get rid of the virus and it continues to cause mischief in a wide variety of ways. And so, you know, l- let's try an antiviral. And, you know, there, there may be many choices in that. In, in part, it was because as we were in conversation with various groups, Pfizer was interested in seeing Paxlovid applied in this way and was willing to provide funding for us to do it and pr- willing to provide the drug. So for us, it was an idea that let's get started. Let, let's, let's try to create a platform where we can do remarkable research in highly efficient ways, utilizing, you know, digital data and, and really see if we can do a dem- decentralized study, one where people don't have to go to sites, build up that platform. And, and if we can start with Paxlovid, let's start. And so that, that's what we did. We got out of the gates with, with a trial that would focus on using Paxlovid for 15 days in people highly symptomatic with long COVID and see whether or not we could learn anything. Right. And that's the distinction that, you know, I just always have to myself be reminded of, which is this is not a study of people who have COVID right now in the first few days of illness. They're getting Paxlovid for a certain number of time, a certain amount of time. And then we look down three, six, nine, 12 months later to see if they got long COVID. That is not what this is. This is people who actually already have the diagnosis of long COVID, right? That's right. That's exactly right. So, you know, those studies are meritorious too. They're prevention studies, you know, can we make an intervention early that lowers the risk of people ever developing something like long COVID? And, and I'm interested in those. I think we all should be. But but there are lots of people out there who are suffering throughout from the ravages of COVID throughout the course of the pandemic, who three months or longer are, you know, still having debilitating symptoms. Many of them are, you know, their lives have been unraveled. And the question is, what can we do to help them? You know, what is going on with them to, to cause the kind of symptoms that they've got? And the what is obviously we're trying to see whether or not an antiviral Paxlovid can make a difference for people who are suffering from long COVID. But but we thought like, can we can we innovate the way that we do trials? And so the the idea was, could we create a, a, a digital decentralized and democratized approach to doing a clinical trial in which we didn't need any sites? We were actually going direct to consumer. We're going straight to people. Uh, one IRB, no site contracts. And what we're doing is, is enlisting people to fill out a questionnaire. If they qualify, we get them to integrate their medical records. We can review the records at a distance. If they qualify, we call them up, make sure what's in the record really reflects their reality, that you know what they understand as their conditions and comorbidities, and do they qualify for this study? If they qualify, we're off to the race. We can randomize them. We ship drug. We send people to their homes to get biospecimens. It goes to Akiko's lab. They do daily diaries on their device. We, we're, you know, we're constant communication with them, a lot digital, some by phone, and they're filling out surveys, the patient report outcome measures, and we're getting the, the feeds from their medical records to look at their healthcare utilization. And all the time, everything's being done from the convenience largely of their home. They don't have to leave. Many of these people are quite debilitated, tired, fatigued, and, and really don't have the financial resources. So for those who are working hourly, 
It would be a big deal to have to take off half a day to go to a site, even to drive, use gas. There are no clinical trial deserts in this study because no matter where you live, you can be part of it. And we rolled rapidly. The, the study, once we sort of worked out the kinks and the processes, is going extraordinarily well. And, and I think it can be a, a means by which we can do highly efficient trials going forward that are really consumer-centric, participant-centric. And, and the other thing is, we don't call these people subjects. They're our partners in the project. We're, we're going to return results to them. We're going to give them access to investigators through town halls when we're, when we're finished. And, and we work hard to treat them with respect. We want them to give us a, like a net promoter score of five. Like, hey, I would brag to my friends that they should be in trials like this because they treat me well. And, and I'm part of the team and we're on a mission together. So yeah, we're really excited about how we did this and think that, that this can be a, a standard going forward. Well, so I'm really interested about um, the idea of not knowing. And one of the real successes of, of COVID, of our COVID experience was active the active trial and the recovery trial in the UK, where just a lot of things were tried. And said, we're not smart enough to know which of these things is going to work. We just know that maybe among this group of 10, uh, one thing will play out. Is Do you feel like you know you have so many people who are interested here that you could throw in at some point a metformin arm or some other arm of the study because, you know, Paxlovid is one thing, but there are other candidates. Yeah, I think that's a really great question and a very important point. I mean, we would be best off to do these kind of platform trials where we're basically, you, you know, in the course of it, we're testing 20 things because, yeah. you know, and, and we, it has to be appropriately, if, if it's an early study, then it's signal finding. If you were really actually trying to test the hypothesis formally, it has to be power to probably, but there are enough people out there who are suffering who could be parts of these. And and we really are moving too slowly. I mean, we're, we, if we just do things one at a time, it, it, we're not gonna learn fast enough to to really solve this problem in, in the near future. So I, I, I like what you're saying and I, I totally agree. It, and that's in part was the idea behind how we built this platform, which is we wanted to be able to build this. So now if you've got five or six more things, if we can get the funding for it, why wouldn't you just build it in. I mean, we're all, we're all set and ready to go. And here we are coming into December of 2023 already. And people are eager for results. Uh, when do you think we're going to get a readout from your study? I think we'll finish up, you know, soon after the first of the year. And I would say by June, I, th I hope we'll be able to have a report out. Uh, our primary endpoint is, is 28 days, the promised 29 physical function scale. So it's, it's sort of a net overall, how your physical health is and uh we we're you know it's the change from baseline but we're collecting a lot of other information mental health a, a whole range of other other things that we'll learn from and again like i said it should be signal finding it's like who were responders if, if there were any and and then we'll be able to see not only characterize them from who were they clinically demographically and so forth but but because of the work that akiko will do in the lab we'll also say were there any baseline biomarkers that were indicative of people who are likely to respond to the treatment and, and then that could advance our understanding of underlying mechanism but also maybe be able to help us figure out who, who should be treated who's going to who's likely to benefit harlan krimmel thanks so much for joining us thanks jeremy it's great to talk to you